Welcome back to General Science Oceanography. We will continue on in week one with video two, History of Oceanography. So just to give you a quick uh, kind of overview, you should definitely look through your textbook. There's a great review um, of all the history of oceanography, what we're going to look through right now, uh, are some um, chunks of um, what we're going to look at now are some chunks of recent history, starting with the early years. 1807 to 1865, we'll go through the breakthrough years, the age of electronics, and then some current methods. And the, there's a great website here that goes into a lot more detail, oceanexplorer.noaa.gov, which um, goes into all of these areas with a lot more detail than I'm going to show you now. So early years would have been um, in the 1800s. You can see some of the charts that were created. Uh, the first one over there of the Atlantic Ocean uh, with the title, A Chart of the Gulf Stream, was created by Ben Franklin in 1769, so a long time ago. A lot of that was based off of old shipping logs. Well, the second image that you see was created um, as a result of this coast survey, which was started around um, 1807 through a law that President Jefferson signed. So this uh, would eventually become what is now known as NOAA. So they compiled a whole bunch of surveys of coastal cities, coastlines, some of that um, kind of dangerous waters where a lot of ships were having problems kind of navigating through those shallow areas. So this also raised some questions about the Gulf Stream. So does the Gulf Stream change seasonally through depth? the change in velocity, the temperature is different. So they sparked some questions uh, and that led into the breakthrough years, uh, 1866 to 1922. A lot of the people who worked for this coast survey program um, ended up helping out during the Civil War at some of these main river maps. Um, one thing that happened during this time frame is there was a cable survey between Havana, Cuba, and Key West, Florida. And what ended up happening, so they were trying to figure out where to lay this, this cable on the ocean floor, so to figure out what the heck was down there. So what they did was they dredged up chunks of the sea floors to see if it was solid rock, uh, if it was loose sediment, and they found a lot of life from these depths that they didn't know was actually there. So this kind of piqued a lot of people's interests and it led to some of these later explorations such as the Challenger. Um, and you can see here one of these dredging techniques, the little image in the lower left hand side. And then the map shows the actual route that this Challenger expedition took. And so what they did was they collected samples from the seafloor, measured depths, figured out what type of sediment was there, if it was rock or loose stuff and then took a survey of what life was, was like at those different areas, so what they found in uh, their dredge samples. So some of the others that, uh, if you go to the NOAA website, you can also read about the gazelle, the albatross, the blake, so on and so forth. So a lot of information about life in the ocean discovered through this Challenger um, and these other expeditions. So around 1923 to 1945, this was the age of electronics. This early section around World War I, World War II, we had a lot of submarines in those wars, and to maneuver in the ocean and not have a, an actual visual of what's happening on the ocean floor, they used sound waves, echo sounding and phthometers to actually um, use sound waves to bounce off of different objects to determine the depth and um, also the surface topography of the ocean floor. Later on they used what's called RAR, uh, radio acoustic ranging, and this could be used anytime, um, big stormy seas, uh, and it also used a survey vessel that would drop charges in different areas, charges would go off, and those sound waves would bounce off of things, and they would have a ship that would actually be recording those um, sound waves that are bouncing off of the uh, ocean floor. Also, uh, temperature and depth instruments were um, starting to be used during this time frame as well. 
So you can see here um, what a pedometer actually looks like around 1930, Herbert Grove Dorsey um, using one in that upper left hand picture. And then lower right hand corner, you can see some of these profiles that were uh, created um, of submarine canyons in the Gulf of Alaska due to some of these um, echo sounding um, trips that were taken. So some, lots of information gathered and um, a lot of this information was actually used by Harry Hess later on to help uh, with this theory of plate tectonics that we'll discuss in a few weeks. So the later half of this age of electronics, 1946 to 1970, this is when Harry Hess was actively looking at the ocean floor, looking at the maps that were created as a result of um, this echo sounding. Um, and he also was looking at the uh, samples that were collected. A lot of these samples actually had magnetic minerals present and they used these things called magnetometers to actually measure the magnetic minerals in these rocks across ocean basins, which in turn then helped out with this idea of plate tectonics and the age of the ocean floor and what the heck's happening down there. Um, also, during this time frame, we saw the first submersibles around the 1960s, and a lot of these submersibles were manned at first, and they discovered some pretty interesting biology and geology at these mid-ocean ridges, a thing called black smokers, and, <clears throat> excuse me. So the first of, of one of these submersibles would be Alvin, most active, successful research submersible, collecting samples, taking videos, photographs of what was found. We also use ships traveling from place to place. Um, some of them actually doing sonar surveys, using sound waves to figure out uh, the surface topography of the ocean floor. And some of them um, collecting core samples, traveling to um, some pretty hairy conditions like you can see in this picture traveling through the Arctic um, in this icebreaker ship. So lots of, of technology available today. We also have um, some ROV, remotely operated vehicles, so we don't require a person to be in that submersible. We can control it um, from the surface. There's some things such as these round features here which are the actual um, propellers to, to move this submersible around and we've got the ballasts on the bottom you can see this um, kind of protective cage around the submersible and then in the front you see a camera so the person who is actually controlling it can also control where that camera goes and take pictures photographs and they have some tools where they can actually collect samples using some of these different um, ROVs so they can take core samples of the surface sediments they can collect um, any ocean organisms living on the seafloor as well, depending on the kind of mechanical arms they have attached. So, so what a typical um, scenario of one of these ROV um, um, explorations would might look like. We have a ship on the surface with all sorts of um, antennas, GPS, um, to be able to not only track where they are located, but also to um, keep in contact with the rover that's on the ocean floor. And they'd have a cable connecting the rover to the actual um, ship, and then the rover could be using sonar to track itself around, figure out where it's going, um, to locate different study sites that are of interest. And you can see by this image here of the ROPOS, some of the instruments, there would be lights, strobe lights, cameras, sonars, transporters, cameras, um, buoyancy to be able to move up and down in the water column, different arms that can reach um, different areas and attach different types of instrumentation on top of that. Pretty interesting stuff. We can also look at um, the actual sea surface and what uh, is commonly used are what are called drifters. And these drifters, you can see a, a map here, the global, the status of the global drifter array showing you where some of these drifters are actually located in the ocean. 
And so what this drifter does is you have a, a top flotation device and then this kind of a windsock feature that sinks down into the ocean um, surface, depending on how deep they want to go, they'll have a different sized windsock below it. And what this thing will do is actually be carried and, and carried along in these surface, surface ocean currents. So we can measure temperature, um, we can measure salinity, it can actually have a GPS a system attached to it so it can track where it's going, track velocities, all sorts of, of really interesting stuff um, with these these buoys that can actually move from place to place. So these are drifters, so they actually are at the whim of the ocean currents. There are also buoys that can be stationary where they don't necessarily move, they're anchored to a certain spot all the time, so you can get seasonal variations in one location. And there's also um, another type of drifter that well, is actually um, something that they can control and set a course in this drifter. And it can not only uh, does it stay on the ocean surface, but it can also dive down um, to deeper depths to figure out temperature variations, um, salinity variations as you go deeper inside the ocean. So it's kind of a brief, brief history of oceanography, including some of the different tools that are used currently and how it's different from what we used in the past. So stay tuned. Next uh, video, we will talk about what's uh, the ocean like, what's the geography of the, the ocean basins, and what's happening in our neck of the woods.